Chapter 11, Part 2 of The Scouts of Stonewall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Scouts of Stonewall by Joseph A. Altscheller. Chapter 11, The Night Ride, Part 2. They emerged from the woods, opened the gate, and rode upon the lawn. Not a ray of light came from the house anywhere. Every door and shutter was fast. "'Knock on the door with the hilt of your sword, Harry,' said Dalton. "'It'll bring Cousin Eliza. She can't have gone to sleep yet.' Harry dismounted and, holding the reins of his horse over his arm, knocked loudly. There was no reply. "'Beat harder, Harry. She's sure to hear.' Harry beat upon that door until he bruised the hilt of his sword. At last it was thrown open violently, and a powerful woman of middle years appeared. "'I thought you Yankees had gone forever,' she exclaimed. "'You better hurry or Stonewall Jackson will get you before morning.' "'We're not Yankees, ma'am,' said Harry politely. "'We're Southerners, Stonewall Jackson's own men, "'scouts from his army, here looking for news of the enemy. "'A fine tale, young man. "'You're trying to fool me with your gray uniform. "'Stonewall Jackson's men are fifteen miles north of here, "'chasing the Yankees by thousands into the Potomac. "'They say he does it just as well by night as by day, "'and that he never sleeps or rests.' "'What my comrade tells you is true. "'Good evening, Cousin Eliza,' said a gentle voice beyond Harry. The woman started and then stepped out of the door. Dalton rode forward a little where the full moonlight fell upon him. "'You remember that summer six years ago when you spanked me for stealing the big yellow apples in the orchard?' "'George! Little George Dalton!' she cried, and as Dalton got off his horse she enclosed him in a powerful embrace, although he was little no longer. "'And have you come from Stonewall Jackson?' she asked, breathless with eagerness. "'Straight from him. I'm on his staff, and so is my friend here.' This is Harry Ketton of Kentucky, Mrs. Pomeroy, and he's been through all the battles with us. We were watching from the woods, and we saw those Yankees at your door. They didn't get any information, I know that, but I'm thinking that we will. Cousin Eliza Pomeroy laughed a low, deep laugh of pride and satisfaction. Come into the house, she exclaimed. I'm here with four children. Jim, my husband, is with Johnston's army before Richmond, but we've been able to take care of ourselves thus far, and I reckon we'll keep on being able. I can get hot coffee and good corn cakes ready for you inside of fifteen minutes. It's not food we want, Cousin Eliza, said Dalton. We want something far better, what those Yankees came for, news. So I think we'd better stay outside and run no risk of surprise. The Yankees might come back. That's so. You'll grow up into a man with a heap of sense, George. I've got real news, and I was waiting for a chance to send it through to Stonewall Jackson. Billy? Billy? A small boy, not more than twelve, but clothed fully, darted from the inside of the house. He was well set up for his age, and his face was keen and eager. "'This is Billy Pomeroy, my oldest son,' said Cousin Eliza Pomeroy, with a swelling of maternal pride. "'I made him get in bed and cover himself up, boots and all, when the Yankees came. Billy has been riding today. He ain't very old, and he ain't very big. But put him on a horse, and he's mighty nigh a man.' The small, eager face was shining. "'What did you see, Billy, when you rode so far?' asked Dalton. "'Yankees! Yankees, Cousin George, and lots of them, toward Manassas Gap. "'I saw some of their cavalry this side of the Gap, "'and I heard at the store that there was a big army on the other side, "'marching hard to come through it and get in behind our stone wall.' "'Harry looked at Dalton. "'That confirms the rumors we heard,' he said. "'You can believe anything that Billy tells you,' said Mrs. Pomeroy. "'I know it,' said Dalton, "'but we've got to go and see these men for ourselves.' "'Stonewall Jackson's a terrible man, Cousin Eliza. "'If we tell him that the Yankees are coming through Manassas Gap "'and closing in on his rear, he'll ask us how we know it, "'and when we reply that a boy told us, "'he'll break us as unfit to be on his staff.' "'And I reckon Stonewall Jackson will be about right,' "'said Cousin Eliza Pomeroy, "'who was evidently a woman of strong mind. "'Billy, you lead these boys straight to Manassas Gap.' "'Oh, no, Cousin Eliza,' exclaimed Dalton. "'Billy's been riding hard all day, and we can find the way.' "'What do you think Billy's made out of?' asked his mother contemptuously. "'Ain't he a valley boy? Ain't he Jim Pomeroy's son and mine? "'I want you to understand that Billy can ride anything, "'and he can ride it all day long and all night long, too.' "'Make him let me go, Ma!' exclaimed Billy eagerly. "'I can save time. I can show him the shortest way.' Harry and George glanced at each other. Young Billy Pomeroy might be of great value to them. Moreover, the choice was already made for them "'because Billy was now running to the stable for his horse.' "'He goes with us, or rather, he leads us, Cousin Eliza,' said Dalton. Billy appeared the next instant, with his horse saddled and bridled, and his own proud young self in the saddle. 
"'Billy, take him straight,' said his Spartan mother, as she drew him down in the saddle and kissed him, and Billy, more swollen with pride than ever, promised that he would. But the mother's voice broke a little when she said to Dalton, "'He's to guide you wherever you want to go, but you must bring him back to me unhurt.' "'We will, Cousin Eliza,' said Dalton earnestly. Then they galloped away in the dark with Billy leading and riding like a Comanche. He had taken a fresh horse from the stall, and it was almost as powerful as those ridden by Harry and Dalton. "'See the mountains,' said Billy, pointing eastward to a long dark line dimly visible in the moonlight. "'That's the Blue Ridge, and further south is the Gap, but you can't see it at night until you come right close to it.' "'Do you know any path through the woods, Billy?' asked Harry. "'We don't want to run the risk of capture.' "'I was just about to lead you into it,' replied the boy, still rejoicing in the importance of his role. "'Here it is.' He turned off from the road into a path leading into thick forest, wide enough for only one horse at a time. Billy, of course, led. Harry followed, and Dalton brought up the rear. The path, evidently a shortcut used by farmers, was enclosed by great oaks, beeches, and elms, now in full leaf, and it was dark there. Only a slit of moonlight showed from above, and the figures of the three riders grew shadowy. "'They'll never find us here, will they, Billy?' said Harry. "'Not one chance in a thousand. Them Yankees don't know a thing about the country. Anyway, if they should come into the path at the other end, we'd hear them long before they heard us.' "'You're right, Billy, and as we ride on, we'll all three listen with six good ears.' "'Yes, sir,' said Billy. Harry, although only a boy himself, was so much older than Billy, who addressed him as sir, that he felt himself quite a veteran. "'Billy,' he said, "'how did it happen that you were riding down this way, so far from home, today?' "'Cause we heard there was Yanks in the Gap. Ma won't let me go and fight with Stonewall Jackson. She says I ain't old enough and big enough, but she told me herself to get on the horse and ride down this way, and see if what we heard was true.' I saw him in little bunches, and then that gang came to our house tonight, less than ten minutes after I come back. We'll be at a creek, sir, in less than five minutes. It runs down from the mountains, and it's pretty deep with all them big spring rains. I guess we'll have to swim, sir. We could go lower down, where there's always a ford, but that's where the Yankees will be crossing. We'll swim, if necessary, Billy. When even the women and little children fight for us, the South will be hard to conquer, was Harry's thought but he said no more until they reached the creek, which was indeed swollen by the heavy rains, and was running swiftly, a full ten feet in depth. "'Hold on, Billy, I'll lead the way,' said Harry. But Billy was already in the stream, his short legs drawn up, and his horse swimming strongly. Harry and Dalton followed without a word, and the three emerged safely on the eastern side. "'You're a brave swimmer, Billy,' said Harry admiringly. "'Tain't nothing, sir. I didn't swim, it was my horse. I guess he'd take me across the Mississippi itself.' I wouldn't have anything to do but stick on his back. Look up, sir, and you can see the mountains close by. Harry and Dalton looked up through the rift in the trees and saw almost over them the lofty outline of the Blue Ridge, the eastern rampart of the valley, heavy with forest from base to top. We must be near the gap, said Dalton. We are, said Billy. We've been coming fast. It's nigh on to fifteen miles from here to home. It must be a full thirty to Harper's Ferry, said Dalton. "'Does this path lead to some point overlooking the gap?' asked Harry, "'where we can see the enemy if he's there and he can't see us?' "'Yes, sir. We can ride on a slope not more than two miles from here "'and look right down into the gap.' "'And if troops are there, we'll be sure to see their fire,' said Dalton. "'Lead on, Billy.' "'Billy led with boldness and certainty. "'It was the greatest night of his life, "'and he meant to fulfill to the utmost what he deemed to be his duty. The narrow path still wound among mighty trees, the branches of which met now and then over their heads, shutting out the moonlight entirely. It led at this point toward the north, and they were rapidly ascending a shoulder of the mountain, leaving the gap on their right. Harry, riding on such an errand, felt to the full the weird quality of mountains and forest, over which darkness and silence brooded. The foliage was very heavy, and it rustled now and then as the stray winds wandered along the slopes of the Blue Ridge. But for that and the hoofbeats of their own horses, there was no sound save once when they heard a scuttling on the bark of a tree. They saw nothing, but Billy pronounced it a wildcat, alarmed by their passage. The three at length came out on a level place, or tiny plateau. Billy, who rode in advance, stopped, and the others stopped with him. "'Look,' said the boy, pointing to the bottom of the valley about five hundred feet below. A fire burned there, and they could discern men around it, with horses in the background. "'Yankees,' said Billy. "'Look at him through the glasses.' Harry raised his glasses and took a long look. They had the full moonlight where they stood, and the fire in the valley below was also a help. He saw that the camp was made by a strong cavalry force. Many of them were asleep in their blankets, but the others sat by the fire and seemed to be talking. 
Then he passed the glasses to Dalton, who also, after looking long and well, passed them to Billy, as a right belonging to one who had been their real leader, and who shared equally with them their hardships and dangers. "'How large would you say that force is, George?' asked Harry. Three or four hundred men, at least. There's a great bunch of horses. I should judge, too, from the careless way they've camped that they have no fear of being attacked. How many do you think there are, Billy?' "'Just about what you said, Cousin George. Are you going to attack them?' Harry and Dalton laughed. "'No, Billy,' replied Dalton. "'You see we're only three, and there must be at least three hundred down there.' "'But we've been hearing that Stonewall Jackson's men never mind a hundred to one,' said Billy, in an aggrieved tone. "'We hear that's just about what they like.' "'No, Billy, my boy. We don't fight a hundred to one. Nobody does, unless it's like Thermopylae in the Alamo.' "'Then what are we going to do?' continued Billy, in his disappointed tone. "'I think, Billy, that Harry and I are going to dismount, slip down the mountainside, see what we can see, hear what we can hear, and that you'll stay here, holding and guarding the horses until we come back.' "'I won't!' exclaimed Billy, in violent indignation. "'I won't, Cousin George. I'm going down the mountain with you and Mr. Kenton.' "'Now, Billy,' said Dalton soothingly, "'you've got a most important job here. You're the reserve, and you also hold the means of flight.' Suppose we're pursued hotly. We couldn't get away without the horses that you'll hold for us. Suppose we should be taken. Then it's for you to gallop back with the news that Shields' whole army will be in the pass in the morning, and under such circumstances your mother would send you on to General Jackson with a message of such immense importance. That's so, said Billy with conviction, in the face of so much eloquence and logic. But I don't want you fellows to be captured. Dalton and Harry dismounting gave the reins of their horses into the hands of Billy, and the small fingers clutched them tightly. "'Stay exactly where you are, Billy,' said Harry. "'We want to find you without trouble when we come back.' "'I'll be here,' said Billy proudly. Harry and Dalton began the descent through the bushes and trees. They had not the slightest doubt that this was the vanguard of the northern army, which they heard was ten thousand strong, and that this force was merely a vanguard for McDowell, who had nearly forty thousand men. But they knew too well to go back to Stonewall Jackson with mere surmise, however plausible. "'We've got to find out some way or other whether their army is really at hand,' whispered Dalton. Harry nodded and said, "'We must manage to overhear some of their talk, though it's risky business. "'But that's what we're here for. "'They don't seem to be very watchful, and as the woods and bushes are thick about them, we may get a chance.' They continued their slow and careful descent. Harry glanced back once through an opening in the bushes and saw little Billy holding the reins of the three horses and gazing intently after them. He knew that among all the soldiers of Jackson's army, no matter how full of valor and zeal they might be, there was not one who surpassed Billy in eagerness to serve. They reached the bottom of the slope, and lay for a few minutes hidden among dense bushes. Both had been familiar with country life, they had hunted the possum and the coon many a dark night, and now their forest lore stood them in good stead. They made no sound as they passed among the bushes and trailing vines, and they knew that they were quite secure in their covert, although they lay within a hundred yards of one of the fires. Harry judged that most of the men whom they saw were city-bred. It was an advantage that the South had over the North in a mighty war, waged in a country covered then mostly with forest and cut by innumerable rivers and creeks, that her sons were familiar with such conditions, while many of those of the North, used to life in the cities, were at a loss when the great campaigns took them into the wilderness. Both he and Dalton, relying upon this knowledge, crept a little closer, but they stopped and lay very close when they saw a man advancing to a hillock, carrying under his arm a bundle which they took to be rockets. "'Signals,' whispered Dalton. "'You just watch, Harry, and you'll see him answered from the eastward.' The officer on the summit of the hillock sent up three rockets, which curved beautifully against the blue heavens, then sank and died. Far to the eastward they saw three similar lights flame and die. "'How far away would you say those answering rockets were?' whispered Harry. "'It's hard to say about distances in the moonlight, but they may be three or four miles.' I take it, Harry, that they are sent up by the northern main force. So do I, but we've got to get actual evidence and words, or we've got to see this army. I'm afraid to go back to General Jackson with anything less. Now we won't have time to go through the gap, see the army, and get back to the general before things begin to happen, so we've got to stick it out here until we get what we want. True words, Harry, and we must risk going a little nearer. See that line of bushes running along there in the dark? It will cover us, and we're bound to take the chance. We must agree, too, Harry, that if we're discovered, neither must stop in an attempt to save the other. If one reaches Jackson, it will be all right. Of course, George. We'll run for it with all our might, and if it's only one, it's to be the better runner. 
They lay almost flat on their stomachs, and passing through the grass, reached the line of bushes. Here they could rise from such an uncomfortable position, and stooping they came within fifty yards of the first fire, where they saw very clearly the men who were not asleep, and who yet moved about. Most of them were not yet sunburned, and Harry judged at once that they had come from the mills and workshops of New York or New England. As far as he could see, they had no pickets, and he inferred their belief that no enemy was nearer than Jackson's army, at least thirty miles away. Perhaps the little band of horsemen who had knocked at Mrs. Pomeroy's door had brought them the information. They lay there nearly an hour, not thinking of the danger, but consumed with impatience. Officers passed near them talking, but they could catch only scraps, not enough for their purpose. A set of signals was sent up again, and was answered duly from the same point to the east of the gap. But after long waiting they were rewarded. Few of the officers or men ever went far from the fires. They seemed to be at a loss in the dark and silent wilderness which was absolute confirmation to Harry that they were city dwellers. Two officers, captains or majors, stopped within twenty feet of the crouching scouts, and gazed for a long time through the gap toward the west in the valley, at the northern end of which Jackson and his army lay. "'I tell you, Curtis,' one of them said at last, "'that if we get through the gap tomorrow and Fremont and the others also come up, Jackson can possibly get away. We'll have him and his whole force in a trap, and with three or four to one in our favor it will all be over.' "'It's true if it comes out as you say, Penfield,' said the other. "'But there are several ifs, and as we have reason to know, it's hard to put your hand on Jackson. "'Why, when we thought he was lost in the mountains, he came out of them like an avalanche, "'and some of our best troops were buried under that avalanche. "'You're too much of a pessimist, Curtis. We've learned a lot in the last few days. "'As sure as you and I stand here, the fox will be trapped. "'Why, he's trapped already. We'll be through the gap here with ten thousand men in the morning, "'squarely in Jackson's rear. "'Tomorrow we'll have fifty or sixty thousand good troops between him and Richmond and Johnston.' His army will be taken or destroyed, and the Confederacy will be split asunder. McClellan will be in Richmond with an overwhelming force, and within a month the war will be practically over. There is no doubt of that, if we catch Jackson, and it certainly looks as if the trap were closing down upon him. In defeating Banks and then following him to the Potomac, he has ruined himself in his cause. Harry felt a deadly fear gripping at his heart. What these men were saying was probably true. Every fact supported their claim. The tough and enduring North, ready to sustain any number of defeats and yet win, was pouring forward her troops with a devotion that would have wrung tears from a stone, and she was destined to do it again and again through dark and weary years. The two men walked further away, still talking, but Harry and Dalton could no longer hear what they were saying. The rockets soared again in the pass, and were answered in the east, but now nearer, and the two knew that it was not worth while to linger any longer. They knew the vital fact that ten thousand men were advancing through the pass, and that all the rest was superfluity, and time had a value beyond price to their cause. End of chapter 11, part 2